Good afternoon. Um, my name is Poe Walker. I'm Chief Counsel Commissioner of Sharon Bowen, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And before I start, my standard disclaimer, which is that my views are not are, are my own. I mean, they are my own, but they are not that of the commissioner, the commission, or the staff. I meant to be an inch or so taller today. I brought my heels in my bag, and I opened the bag and found two different sets of heels. So <laughs> sorry, I kind of get the okay. Um, so, uh, today I want to talk about central clearing. I'll say a few words at first about the benefits of clearing, and then talk about how our office, the Office of Commissioner Bowen, has been involved in discussions about central clearing and systemic risk through our advisory committee. And then there are three issues I want to touch on that I think are pertinent right now for the future of clearing, the effectiveness of clearing, that being FCM concentration, um, uncleared margin, and also CCP risk management generally. So first about the benefits of central clearing. Um, you know, given all the discussions, I think it makes sense to step back for a second and talk about what central clearing does that's good for our economy, that's good from a risk perspective. The, um, the, the benefit of central clearing, well, there are multiple benefits, but when it's done properly, you have the risk centralized in an entity that's a repeat player. They're able to effectively engage in risk management, able to come up with the right collateral amount, and have that in a centralized system, which they're constantly getting new information and making thoughtful decisions about how much collateral should be there. It's transparent. The regulator can see it, right? Pre-2008, we didn't know what was out there, didn't know who the players were. Now, at least for these central, the, the, these cleared products, we know who the players are. We know how much collateral is out there. We know who is super exposed to who, at least in that space. And so that's really important for liquid products that are standardized. Central clearing is wonderful. It's great, and it helps to mitigate systemic risk. Now, um, in terms of how our office, and, and I'll talk more about some of the other sides of this, I want to step back for a second and talk about our office, uh, Commissioner Bowen's office, and how we've been involved in this discussion, which of course affects how we're looking at these issues. So Commissioner Bowen is sponsor of the Market Risk Advisory Committee, and there are a number of advisory committees in the federal government. They're all composed of industry, um, people from, or, or entities from, uh, from all parts of the market, and they focus on different issues. And the purpose of the advisory committee is to get the viewpoint of the market on what the commission is doing and also what's going on out there that we may not be appropriately focusing on in our oversight. And so the benefit of an advisory committee is that you get a bunch of viewpoints at the same time on one issue. Especially when you're in a commissioner's office, entities are always walking in one at a time, of course, and they're, they're talking their own book, and it certainly makes sense while they're there, and then someone else comes from, from another part of the market, and they have a whole different viewpoint on reality. So as a regulator, it's very helpful to have all the players, or many of the players, at the table talking about one issue, and then at least we can see them respond to each other and get a better sense of the truth, right? So now our... Uh, our, our committee, the MRAC, is focused on two things, market risk, meaning systemic risk, real economy shaking potentially risk, and market structure. So we look at, um, or, or, or rather we ask the industry to opine on what's happening out there that could pose a systemic risk and whether or not we are addressing it as a regulator appropriately and also what's happening in terms of the evolution of the market that we may not be aware of and of course, how is it that our regulation is, uh, is currently affecting that? And so we focus on market risk and market structure in our committee. We have diverse members, clearing houses, clearing members, asset managers, end users, uh, academics. And we've had uh, two meetings so far. We have one meeting coming out on Monday. And at, at our first meeting, April 2nd meeting, we looked at how the CCPs were preparing for the default, right, the unlikely but catastrophic event of the default of a significant clearing member, right? There are several clearing members that default all the time, but in not all the time, but often are defaulting and they know how to handle that. I mean, significant ones, ones that actually could really rock the, rock the market. And so we asked three CCPs to give presentations on 
on the things they're doing, their drills, etc., to prepare for that unlikely but catastrophic event. And then we had the clearing members there, we had the asset managers there, we had academics there to talk about the degree to which they believed that these plans were sensible, would actually make sense in the cases actually happened, they were robust enough, etc. So we had a really great discussion. There were a couple of themes that, that came out. One was that um, there need to be more information exchange between CCPs, between CCPs and clearing members in peacetime so that when this actually happens, we are really ready for it or as ready as we could be. We're never really ready for it, but as ready as we could be. Also, there was definitely a push to standardize some procedures across CCPs. Clearing members noted that the average clearing member, definitely the big ones, have multiple CCP relationships. And so if something actually happens, we have to do these auctions. It's difficult having all these different rule books and having to scramble and do things. So to what degree can the CCPs before that coordinate or even make their differences clear such that the clear members are ready? And definitely there were some questions as to, what, as to whether these plans were robust enough. Clearing members, many of them are banks. You know, they have a better, they have a, 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 a better sense, I think that's true, a better sense of what life would be like if a bank is about to fall apart. And, and they weren't as confident that those plans were reflective of that reality. So that's another issue. And definitely increased coordination, right? So after that, that conversation, the two remaining questions that we had were number one, you know, can these plans be more robust? Can they be more reflective of uh, you know, of this event that they're, that, that they're trying to plan for. And secondly, can CCPs coordinate better? So our subcommittee then started having meetings uh, behind the scenes to talk about these two questions. And at our Monday meeting, we're actually going to hear uh, the subcommittee suggestions on how the plans be more robust. So, but that's an example of how uh, Commissioner Bowen's office has been engaged in these issues. We also had a discussion about FCM concentration and liquidity at, at our second meeting. So now to the three issues that I think are very relevant for clearing today. Well, one is FCM concentration. Not a new trend, right? The number of clearing members has been depleting over the years for a number of reasons, business reasons, just capital requirements going up on the CFTC side. But we can't deny that the current interest rate environment makes being a clearing member not, you know, um, not very profitable. And we can't deny that SLR has had an effect on that. And so right now we are dealing with, um, or from, from the anecdotes that we've heard, the FCM concentration is a real issue. And users are saying that, they are having conversations with their clearing members in which the member is asking for multiples of, 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 of monies in, in order to have the same types of transactions they had before. We have heard of firing of customers we have heard that these things are really happening and the number of F FCMs, at least the, the footprint of the FCMs, is definitely dwindling. And you know, from our perspective, from my perspective, speak for myself, from my perspective, this doesn't really make sense. Capital is great and helpful to, to, to mitigate systemic risk, but so is clearing. Clearing has a role in that in the derivatives market. And so when capital undermines clearing, that definitely doesn't seem like the way things should be. And so our chairman has been very vocal. Uh, my commissioner has been vocal on this issue. We are talking to the regulators on the other side and definitely trying to come to a, um, a, you know, um, come to a place in which it, it seems to make more sense to us. And so that's definitely happening. But from our perspective at, um, at, at Commissioner Bowen's office, from my perspective, the, the, there's still a question as to how is the market responding, what's happening in the interim. So while these discussions are happening and hopefully they're successful, what's happening, what's the market doing? Um, how come more entities that are not banks aren't entering the FCM space? Right, maybe that's a dumb question, but, but it's definitely a question that we have, right? Banks have the capital issue. Non-banks don't have a capital issue. So how come they aren't you know, flooding to take up this business that's sitting out there? And I think that as a regulator, we have to, to step back and look at the FCM model, look at the requirements that we have for FCMs, and ask whether they are appropriate for the task. See, one of the challenges is that because clearing members have always been banks, 
to some degree, you regulate based on that bank model, right? So banks have deep pockets. Banks are regulated by other entities, and they're, they're very highly regulated. And so if banks are pulling back for these reasons, then do we need to kind of think about, okay, maybe we need to, to expand our horizons in terms of, you know, good, appropriate clearing members. And certainly that we've seen the market is moving. We just had Citadel became a direct clearing member, right? So this direct clearing member model, this, this, uh, this um, individual seg model, we definitely have questions about that. We have questions about how the market is moving and whether or not um, risk is implicated and whether or not we have a grasp on these, you know, on these new entrants, on these new models. So that's a question, you know, really, really trying to see how FCM concentration is affecting what's happening and you know, hopefully we can uh, turn that around with the regulatory discussions, but in the interim, what's happening and how should we respond, if at all, uh, based on those changes. The other issue I wanna talk about of my three is on CCP risk management. We have certainly heard individually and, 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 and on the MRAC from clearing members and others that they're not as confident in the CCP's risk management as the CCP's are, right? So issues that have been raised, uh, stress testing, um, how are they stress testing, should those be standardized? That's a, that's a common question. Definitely skin in the game was, uh, was a very popular topic not too long ago, and we still hear about that. But the CCP's, whether all of them have enough funds in between the defaulters' funds and the non-defaulters funds on the waterfall in order to properly incentivize them to risk manage appropriately. So right, we've heard that. Um, margin methodology, um, definitely asking questions about how they're determining the appropriate margin, how they're determining which products to clear, and that being more transparent to the, uh, to the industry. It's certainly transparent to us as a regulator because before CCP, or, or rather a DCO, our DCOs, put a product up for clearing, they have to go through the process of explaining to us why this makes sense, why it's appropriate, why it's liquid enough. And so we have that transparency, but the industry doesn't. And so that's definitely an issue that has been raised. And of course, resolution and recovery planning for the CCPs and, and cybersecurity. So we've, we've heard of those, they're, they're, they're certainly international, um, international initiatives happening on the stress testing and the margin methodology side. We know the PFMI framework is coming out soon, and that I think will really help with the transparency aspect of things. Um, but, they, but, but the, uh, but, I'm sorry, but as a regulator, we need to kind of definitely uh, step back and make sure that clearing is working as it should. Clearing has benefits when it is done appropriately. But we do have to look at the kinds of products that are being cleared. You know, standardized liquid products make sense to clear. But especially, and I'll talk about lastly, the uncleared margin rule, especially based on the incentives that that rule creates, we don't want uh, products to go onto clearing that are not appropriate for clearing. And you know, so that, that, that's a question. And so as a regulator, you know, definitely um, just thinking about the, the, uh, the ways in which CCPs are engaging in risk management, not that they aren't doing a great job, not that they aren't doing it with the right intention, but we definitely need to be on top of that because clearing works well when it, when it works well, when it's being done well. And so that's our responsibility to keep an eye on those things and keep asking those questions. And then lastly, on the uncleared margin rule, which uh, currently uh, it, it's under deliberation at our commission, so I'm limited in what I can say about things that are currently being discussed. But I will say that Uncleared margin is very important to the systemic risk uh, scheme. Uh, uncleared margin or risk mitigation for uncleared products was one of the key tenets of the G20, along with clearing reporting and execution. It's very important that we have rules for this space. There will always be products that don't make sense to clear. They need to be out there. But we have to be much more comfortable than we were before 2008 to their being properly collateralized. And so the uncleared margin rule is, 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 is important in order to, to stop up the holes in the, you know, in the, 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 the risk you know, structure, right? They're very important. And, but the question then is how will the uncleared margin rule affect clearing? 
right? Because those things, you know, those things affect each other. And it is possible, as I mentioned before, that if the uncleared margin rule, you know, if that margin is more burdensome, then, then it might, you know, certain entities might want to push things on to clearing that maybe um, the clearinghouse doesn't have enough information to really accurately um, come up with margin and come up with uh, the, the, uh, the, the risk scenarios, et cetera. And so, you know, that, that's important to see how those two rules or those two aspects affect each other. And once you put uncleared margin, the uncleared margin rule into the, you know, into the, you know, um, out, then how will that affect what's happening on clearing? And so that's important. Uh, will it be more or less attractive to clear, right? So if the margin is, you know, um, if that uncleared margin rule is, is particularly burdensome, maybe clearing looks more attractive. If it's too easy, maybe it looks less attractive. And so those are issues to, to think about, not that we, as regulators, you know, push in one way or the other, that's not our role. The market needs to make its own decisions. You have to kind of make sure that we've uh, properly incentivized risk management everywhere. But it is important to understand how, how one will affect the other. And of course, the, the big issue that um, we saw with the, FD, the FDIC rulemaking and just in terms of the discussion that we, the discussion that we've had is on inter-affiliate clearing. And that's something that we've, we've been discussing. I know there's lots of interest in there and how we'll come out on that. Um, but that definitely is under discussion. And we, we've heard on both sides um, why that margin is needed and why it's not. And uh, we're, we're in deep discussion about those matters. Uh, but those are the three areas that I wanted to highlight. And um, that's all I have. I don't know if we're doing questions or. Yes. Uh, uh, quantify. Uh, you mentioned collaboration between CCPs. Uh, uh, markets, uh, banks want uh, CCPs to have a kind of uh, across CCP rating agreements. And uh, what's your view as the regulators on this? And uh, do you think it will happen soon? You know, I'm actually not sure, and I won't tell you what I don't know. We've been looking at the, at the agreements and trying to figure out if they make sense, you know, from our perspective in these different uh, jurisdictions because, and, and that issue really comes up um, in terms of the risk, in terms of reporting, and trying, and thinking about if something really happens and some clear member goes down and we have to kind of quickly move things around, these netting agreements, as we understand it, can really get in the way of moving things quickly, even now in a non-crisis time, they, they get in the way. And so we've been looking at and trying to understand, at least from our office and myself, trying to understand why they're there, you know, are there ways to streamline that, what can the, the CCPs do? But in terms of your question, I, I haven't gotten to that, to that question at all yet, so I'm not ready to answer it. Sorry. Um, you mentioned that one of, one of the issues that, that you highlighted, oh, sorry, one of the issues that you highlighted was the um, transparency. And so as the primary supervisor of CCPs, mm -hmm. it's in your power to improve the transparency that CCPs provide right. with respect to stress testing, margining, you know, proving that their default waterfall is sufficient under lots of different circumstances. So, so what is the CFTC doing to actually improve that transparency? Well, the CFTC has been involved in these uh, international discussions. The PFMI framework that's coming out, I think, will definitely tremendously help in terms of transparency. We've been involved in that. Uh, Commissioner Bowen has consistently talked about the increased transparency and trying to figure out how much CCPs can tell without, you know, getting into privacy issues that they have um, agreements themselves that are private and they have contractual issues as well. And so uh, Commissioner Bowen has always uh, pushed for greater transparency, but of course we're thoughtful about um, you know, the, the CCP's uh, you know, issues that, that, that they raise along those lines in terms of privacy, et cetera, and they've been very vocal, vocal about that at uh, MRAC meetings as well. And so yes, uh, the, the, the CFTC is, not the CFTC, myself, speak for myself, uh, the, uh, it's important that we have transparency, and we have been, and, and the commission has been, you know, on record clearly involved in pushing that internationally. And I think we are seeing some big changes. That framework, as I understand it, is going to be quite revolutionary in terms of what um, what the industry can understand about their CCPs and being able to compare them. 
Uh, not only that, but the industry has also created their own tools. You know, FIA has a product where they're comparing CCPs. I, um, I'm, you know, I, I, I think based just on their rule books that are currently out there now, not even on the framework, which, which isn't out yet. And so there are several pushes to be able to explain to the industry what CCPs are doing and compare them. Uh, but the, the, um, definitely our office has been very vocal about the importance of doing that. Yes. Hi, how are you? Um, you touched upon a point about not, not trying to um, push products to clearing unless they're ready. They need to be liquid and they need to be standardized. So right now we're talking about interest rate swaps and index credit default swaps, but there's <laughs> been talk about um, additional products being mandated for clearing, NDFs, uh, FX options, commodity swaps. Do you have any, any idea or feeling when, when that timeline will move forward? No idea at all. I know before I came into the commission a year ago, we thought that NDF clearing was happening like in a few months, <laughs> and then it wasn't. And so, um, you know, now the you know the staff is working on different clearing terminations. It hasn't risen to our office's level yet, so I would be just you know talking and not telling the truth. Right. Thank you so much.